Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again. And now, on to the story. Story number one. So, uh, what's the biggest gun you've ever made? Written by In Babylon They Wept. No matter the species, no matter the career, if you get a handful of male co-workers together in the same space as alcohol, there will be a schlong measuring contest. The only question is if it will be a literal or metaphorical. Thankfully, this time it was metaphorical. You should have seen it, Valra slurred. All of his manipulator pincers splayed wide as he tried to give the sense of vastness. Tail to claw, the calls must have been... Uh, grill me like a shrimp, at least 200 meters long. To get the timing right, we had to start using relativity crap. Nadita, crack open the books and find that nonsense. Hadn't touched it since I got me cert. That's nothing, Rissing hollered, serrated teeth clicking together as he belted out each fragmentary thought like Billy Mays with a stutter. Got me a contract. Young man, great adventure. Ground to orbit cannon, colony world, 300 meters. Three... Hundred meters power supply alone. Nobody was sure if the gestures he made in that drawn-out silence were intended to convey his respect or his arousal, but both were clearly present. Disturbing. Shala was the most experienced tech at the facility, and he considered it a part of his job to help newbies acclimate. The current new hire was in double culture shock of being at a new job and having his homeworld annexed by the Dark Forest Pact. He figured that it would be a good idea to get this human involved in the conversation, give him a chance to show off a little. He swiveled in his chair, reptilian pupils meeting the human's round ones with ease. You are one of the youngest species we've ever seen here, Earl. You must have done something to catch our attention. What uh, weapon did you make? Earl twitched. It did that a lot, something that China couldn't put down as a human thing or an Earl thing. I, uh, oh, hell, it's a bit of a story. Valrus flailed his antenna around excitedly. Not only was there a promise of a story, but this was the most that they'd managed to pry out of Earl about his past. Share, share. There is alcohol and karka, my mates. There is no better time. Earl twitched again. Maybe it was a human body language thing. Shiloh would have to research this later. I, uh, well, uh, I was from a colony world. Mining world, to be specific. Mostly lithium, but some uranium. It was so pedunk, it didn't even have FTL com back to Terra. We didn't get word that we'd surrendered until, like, uh, a month after the papers were signed. So, we were just sitting there. And then a bunch of you guys showed up to give us the news. And we got nothing. If you're too far in the sticks to have a comm, you are definitely too far in the sticks for an orbital cannon. And we thought that we were getting invaded. Valros's body segments didn't really include a neck, so he tilted the antenna down in the best approximation of a nod. Resinge had been sitting completely wrapped ever since the word colony was mentioned. Shido was feeling a little nervous about this, but he didn't cut the story short. If this ended in some rant about alien bastards, some feelings would be hurt, but it would be part of the heating process. Earl's pause was only as long as it took for him to realize that he still had everyone's attention. Seeing that he hadn't pulled them, he continued. So, um, no cannon... But we got uranium, and we got these big, deep mine shafts, easily four to five kilometers deep, chock full of lithium. So I get this crazy idea right. At the time, I mostly did structural engineering, but I'd been studying some fusion reactor prototypes, and I knew the gist of how fusion bombs work. 
You get a fission starter, set that off, and the pressure wave hits your fusion material, squeezes it hard enough to start fusing, and then the energy of those first bits makes it easier to squeeze the next. And on, and on, until you get a big old cascade. Shiloh and Valros didn't seem to be following. Resinge looked slightly less confused. But Adi just... So what? Your own mind. Blow up. No point. No point. Why? Earl waved his hand, surprisingly nonplussed by the strands of spittle now on his shirt. So you're following the first bit. Set off the nuke in the mine. Get the lithium to start fusing. Get a big boom. But you're thinking that the point was blowing up the mine. And that wasn't it at all. Them shafts got elevators in them. Big ones. And the mine is closed system. Only way the blast can go is up. The realization clicks with all three researchers at once. You use the mine shaft as a barrel, the mother of all fusion bombs as gunpowder. And the elevators as bullets, Earl finished, pleased that he'd finally expressed himself. Resinge made the same gesture that he made before, with a similarly confusing intentions. How fast! Bullet velocity! Huge! Earl squinted his eyes, taking another sip of his beer as he tried to remember. Something like, um, triple escape velocity? Your ships clocked it on their radar at 25 kilometers a second. Shiloh coughed into his beer. Even the Varro's claws clamped together in horror. The only person who seemed particularly pleased was the Basinj, whose whole body tensed for a few seconds before he leaned back in his chair. A hauntingly content look on his face. Earl, good man, best gun, best friend, tired, sleep now. Shyla blinked entirely a few times, nictating membranes and all before turning to Earl. I'm presuming you didn't hit anything. Earl laughed at that. He shyla scorn. Duh. No rifling, no guidance chips, and even if I did, what am I going to do? Swivel the big fecking hole in the ground? Nah, I only got a few elevators within the radar range but it spooked them enough that they didn't want to land. All of the info that Earth gave them said that we had nothing that could reach space, so it made for a real diplomatic kerfuffle. We just pulled the pin on that, watched some badass fireworks, then sat there strutting around like roosters for a month before the Terran Embassy could get the USSN craft here to inform us that we were technically breaking the ceasefire with aliens who'd already kicked our asses. He grinned at the memory but something in the thought soured as he deflated into his seat. You guys were honestly better to me than the colony was. At the time, I was a big hero driving off an alien fleet, but when the battle was done and it turned out to be a misunderstanding, well, everyone was angry as hell that I blew up the mines. Fired was the least of my concerns. They were talking about putting me in jail before you guys offered me this job. Shiloh rested three-fingered hand on his shoulder, a gesture shared between the two races. Home is where you make it. This can be home now. Earl smiled weakly and earnestly. I guess. I guess can. Thanks. He seemed a little uncomfortable with the show of emotion, and Shiloh himself was content that he'd open up this much in one day. So he diverted attention away from the new hire, by starting his own story. So, there we were, trying to figure out how to repurpose an old antimatter farm, when the Valros says to me, The others are too drunk to notice how abrupt the segue is, but the grateful expression that Earl shoots him shows that he isn't. Shiloh is good at his job, good at taking care of his team. He's old enough to retire, but in moments like this it keeps him going, he may not build the next biggest superweapon, but if he can build the person that does, wow, that would be nice. End of story. Story number two. The Omnivore, written by Rosie013. Dave greeted his new colleagues warmly, trying to hide his first day nerves. There were quite a mixed bunch of aliens out here in this isolated orbiting mining platform. Tall, and short, civilized and rough, aloof and boisterous. There were no two the same. They were there to operate the drones that worked on the gas giant planet below. Three shifts of twenty, three overseers and seven support staff. Boring stuff, but it paid well. 
More importantly to Dave, no one cared what your background was so long as you could do the job. No one cared about the obvious inconsistencies in his resume. The petty warrants that would net a few credits for his whereabouts. They were probably in the same boat as him, so to speak. After introductions, everyone went back to the task except one of the overseers, who showed Dave to his bunk, did a short tour, and then a longer safety briefing. Everything else was going fine until lunch. The mess hall was small and clearly well used. Paint scuffed to bare metal and then scuffed further to almost grey on every surface. Dave grabbed a tray and lined up behind the overseer. The server looked up warily. New guy, herbivore or carnivore? Omnivore, sorry, um, that didn't translate. Herbivore or carnivore? Yes. The alien looked at Dave blankly before sighing deeply. Look, new guy, I appreciate you trying to lighten the mood, but I have people to feed. Tell me what to give you and we can joke around in my off time. I'm not being funny with you. Feed me both. You can't have two servings. No, give me half a serving of each. The alien recoiled in disgust. No half servings. We can't cross contaminate for the herbivores. Besides, it makes planning how much I need to make each meal all screwy. Overhearing all of this, the overseer offered his own solution. Can't you just choose one? No, unless you want me to be unwell and unable to work. Technically the truth, Dave wasn't going to do crap if he was forced to give up steak. Confused, the overseer continued. So you are a predator species or pre- a herd species? Yes. Great. Now everyone was looking on bemused. So much for a low-key first day. After a moment of awful silence, the overseer piped up again. Well, you're just going to have to alternate every meal. The server blanched, but said nothing. Wishing to get out of the limelight, there was only one thing Dave could say. Done. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one. And until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.